How will people travel to other planets in the year of 3300? Well, according to the creators of Elite Dangerous Game. Select a planet, we can even see it in the sky, launch our spaceship, and in the Super Cruise mode, fly directly to a planet in what appears to be a straight line. And here we are. But in the times we live, we have no faster than light means of travel. No warp drives, nothing. So we have to go old school. And some people probably think that this is what the actual interplanetary flights really are. But slower. Way slower. Like we see a planet, Jupiter for instance, hop into a spaceship, launch, and fly towards Jupiter and the trajectory looks like this. But an actual flight trajectory to Jupiter would look something like this. Or to Mercury like this. Sure, a straight line might be the shortest path between two points, but the spacecraft don't fly in straight lines and perhaps many of you can guess why. Everything is in constant motion. A space flight from one planet to another isn't like a trip between two cities. It's more like a helicopter flying between two sailing aircraft carriers, which are for some reason sailing at different speeds in circles of different diameters. But anyway, in this hypothetical case, knowing the speeds and trajectories of carriers, we could calculate the flight route of a helicopter to be able to successfully reach a second carrier. But the planets, unlike aircraft carriers, noticeably attract a spacecraft with their gravity, as well as other bodies in the system and the sun especially. So it's not easy to calculate and plan an interplanetary flight. Everything is moving, bodies attract each other, the distances are huge, and at the same time we are strictly limited by the capacity of launch vehicles and overall mass. And yet humanity has been successfully sending spacecraft to planets and other bodies of the solar system for decades, and has in a sense reached interstellar space. But for that we need to know a lot and use some tricks. So how do we actually send spacecraft to other planets? Let's talk about it. My name is Andre. And this is Cosmos Elementary. Obviously, orbital mechanics is a really broad topic and there will be a lot to talk about in future videos. By the way, there is a way to see everything we're going to talk about in practice yourself. Well, sort of. Play Kerbal Space Program and experience the joy or the pain of working on a space mission. Not sponsored, by the way. But why can't we really just fly in a straight line? Well, if it were like in that meme, how much fuel do you want? Yes. I mean, if we could bring all of the fuel, in theory, we could not bother with all those complex trajectories. Though in practice, on the one hand, we would like to deliver a spacecraft to a planet as quickly as possible. And on the other hand, to do it in the most efficient way. Meaning using the least amount of fuel. So during the mission planning, both factors have to be considered and usually one is in the way of the other. Without too much detail, let's say we want to send a spacecraft with scientific instruments to Jupiter. Even if we had the most powerful rocket at our disposal, we would still have a mass limit on what we could bring to space. We have a certain limit and we can choose how to use that. If we bring more fuel for acceleration and maneuvering to reach the target body quicker, we would have less available mass for the scientific instruments. We could get to a planet quicker, but we would learn a lot less about it. I often hear people ask why, let's say, a Mars rover doesn't have these or that tool. So, to a certain extent, because of this mass limit, we cannot simply put everything on it. We have to prioritize the ones that are the most necessary for a current task. So, engineers and scientists try to make a mission reach a target body in a reasonable time span and also have enough scientific instruments. We, of course, can just take a large fuel tank and strap a camera to it, but obviously that would not be the best mission. This is our solar system. This is Earth and we want to send a spacecraft to a nearby planet, let's say to Mars. So far it doesn't matter whether it is a flyby or an orbital mission, we just want to reach Mars. Even when a spacecraft is on top of a rocket at a launch site, it's already in the orbit around the Sun together with Earth. So at a basic level what we need to do is this. We have to sort of jump from the orbit of the Earth around the Sun to the orbit of Mars. And of course not to a random point of this orbit, but where the Mars itself would be at that moment. We obviously shouldn't launch a spacecraft during the closest approach. There are several types of interplanetary missions like flyby missions, where a spacecraft doesn't go into orbit around the body and, well, just uh, flies by it. An early example is Mariner 4 mission. A famous recent example is the New Horizons mission, the first spacecraft to visit Pluto and it has already flown by another Kuiper Belt object, Arakot. We don't have to slow down at the arrival and go into orbit, so it requires less fuel. 
The obvious downside is very limited time for scientific observations of a body. Then there is orbital missions. We don't just simply reach a body, we also have to slow down and enter an orbit around it. Right now there are several spacecraft in the orbit around Mars. It's MRO, Trace Gas Orbiter, Mars Express and so on. So the next step would be a lander, and it becomes even more complicated. Landers could be stationary, like InSight mission on Mars, or rovers. And there are also atmospheric probes and penetrators that smash into a body's surface. The point is that a mission design is heavily dependent on a mission type, as well as the required amount of fuel and the flight trajectory calculations. Also, it would be much more simple if this was what the solar system actually looked like. But it doesn't. In reality, orbits are not perfectly circular and they are not exactly in the same plane. Orbits are ellipses of varying degrees of eccentricity and inclination. There is a number of parameters that are used to describe an orbit, known as Keplerian orbital elements. I won't go into detail about all of them, but let's discuss the ones that are most important for us today. The size and the shape of an orbit are described by such parameters as semi-major axis and eccentricity. Eccentricity is basically how much an orbit derives from a circle, how much it is squashed. If it's an ellipse, it's given a value between 0 and 1. If eccentricity is 0, it means an orbit is a perfect circle, which in the real world is never the case. If the value is between 0 and 1, as I've said, the orbit is an ellipse. All known planets and moons have elliptical orbits. Earth's eccentricity is close to 0, so an orbit looks more like a circle. But for Mercury, it is about 0.2 and it is noticeably elongated. Semi-major axis tells us about the size of an orbit. Also today we would need pericenter and apocenter. Pericenter is the closest point of an elliptical orbit to a central body, whereas apocenter is the farthest one. Though you probably hear more frequently words like perihelion, the closest point to the Sun, or aphelion. But let's get back to the eccentricity. If it equals 1, the orbit is a parabola. But if it is more than 1, it is a hyperbola. Objects on hyperbolic orbits are not bound to the bodies and they can escape them. First known interstellar objects, Oumuamua and Boris of Comet, followed hyperbolic trajectories around the Sun. They entered the solar system and then they left and will never come back. All those four shapes, a circle, an ellipse, a parabola and a hyperbola, are conic sections. So if we, let's say, want to send a spacecraft to interstellar space, we need to do it so that it would go from an elliptical orbit around the Sun to a hyperbolic orbit, like NASA did with Voyagers. Another orbital element is inclination. It is how much the planet's orbit is inclined relative to the ecliptic. And there are other elements like true anomaly, an argument of periapsis and longitude of ascending node. And now let's remember that our spacecraft is already in the orbit around the Sun. So to reach some other planet, we need to change values of its orbital elements. In the case of Mars, we need to increase the size of an orbit, or decrease it if we want to go to inner planets. Again, we have to remember that a planet we want to reach probably also has a different inclination, so we also need to account for that. But to show the basics, I will ignore most of the elements and focus on the size and the shape of an orbit. As I've said, ideally we want to reach, let's say, a planet in a reasonable amount of time using as little fuel as possible. The simplest and the most effective way to do it is a so-called Hohmann transfer orbit. It requires two impulses, or basically two episodes of turning a main engine on. First, to enter the trajectory, and the second, to enter the desired orbit. But it's interesting that Walter Hohmann, who had come up with the idea, described it in 1925 in his work The Attainability of Heavenly Bodies, way before first satellites and spacecraft were launched. The full text of this work is available in the archive, and I leave a link to it in the description with the rest of the sources. Of course, actual calculations of spacecraft trajectories are quite complex. Lots of factors and forces must be taken into account. But at a stage of preliminary analysis, we could use a simplified model. And that would work for us today as well. So at first we have to launch our spacecraft into space and let's say it goes into a parking orbit. It can be there for some time, but we want to achieve escape velocity and leave Earth. What's next? We need to change the velocity and trajectory. If we don't do anything, it will just keep orbiting the Sun along Earth. But to enter the transfer orbit, we need to make the first impulse. Again, because we want to do it efficiently, we don't just fire engines at some arbitrary point in space. We need a change in velocity, or delta v, in a certain direction at a certain time. The acceleration has to be tangential, like this. 
One of the sources I used has this analogy of a racetrack which represents the orbit. If a race car wants to exit the track here and not to roll over and crash, it needs to slow down and take a turn. But if we use this exit, we don't need to slow down but only to put the steering wheel into a starting position. This option requires less effort. That's why the first impulse is also tangential and the point where the impulse is made is calculated in a way for a transfer orbit to eventually bring us to the place we want to reach. With an impulse, we change the orbital elements, we increase the semi-major axis and, if everything is calculated correctly, the pericenter of the new orbit is at the Earth orbit and the apocenter is at the orbit of the body we are heading to. This is what it looks like. Hohmann transfer orbit is shown in yellow. By the way, that's a similar image from Hohmann's book. Have you noticed what else changed besides the size of the orbit? Of course, it is orbital eccentricity. Now it is way more elongated and far from a circle. So what does this tell us? Well, when the spacecraft reaches the epicenter, or in other words, the orbit of Mars, if we don't do anything, it will keep on following this trajectory and eventually get back to Earth's orbit, and then back to Mars' orbit, and then again and again. By the way, there is an actual example of the spacecraft with such an orbit. It's shown in red here. Can you guess what it is? Yeah, it's Elon Musk's Tesla. Though its electric motors won't help it to change an orbit. That's why we need the second impulse. At the epicenter of the transfer orbit, we fire the engine for the second time, again tangentially. And this way we can make it so that the spacecraft had the same orbital velocity as Mars and also the orbit again became more circular. So after the second impulse, the spacecraft is no longer in the transfer highly elliptical orbit. But basically it is in the orbit of Mars around the Sun. And again, if calculations were correct, we would also meet Mars itself and not only reach its orbit. Having arrived at Mars, we would have to slow down, let's say using thrusters, to enter an orbit around the planet. If we want to land on a planet, we need to slow down even further. But that's a completely different story. So without going into too much detail, this is how we can efficiently reach other planets. And that doesn't have to be planets. This trajectory also works for rising orbits of satellites in the Earth orbit. I should also mention that inclination of the spacecraft orbit depends on the latitude of the launch site. Ok, but Mars is farther than Earth from the Sun. And what if we want to go to inner planets? Let's say Venus. Sometimes people ask, why does Earth not fall into the Sun, if the Sun attracts the planet? First, basically, it does fall constantly. And second, it's all about motion. After it had formed in a rotating protoplanetary disk around the Sun, Earth conserved angular momentum and has a certain orbital velocity. But if it suddenly stopped in its orbit, for some reason, it would start actually rushing towards the Sun. Do you see where I'm going with this? To reach Mars, we need to increase the size of the orbit and add orbital energy, accelerating it in the direction of the orbital motion. But if we fire engines in the opposite direction, we decrease orbital energy, thus slowing the spacecraft down and lowering the orbit. And if we could completely stop it, it would fall into the Sun. So after the first impulse, we would have a transfer orbit like this one. So planets are in the gravity well of the Sun. And to get to outer planets, we need to climb out of that well. And to get to inner planets, planets, we need to help a spacecraft fall into it. There are actually two types of trajectories of this kind, which are called, well, trajectories of the first and the second type. The first type is when a spacecraft covers less than 180 degrees in the orbit around the Sun, and the second type is more than 180 degrees. But of course, home and transfer orbit is not the only way to get from one planet to another. In a lecture of an aerospace engineer Bruce Conway, he lists several types of trajectories. The first type is impulsive trajectories of only two impulses, which we already talked about. Then there are more complex ones, with three or more impulses. Both in the first and the second case it is short impulses of high thrust. And the third one is different. The thrust could be almost constant, but it is a very weak thrust. For instance, spacecraft with iron engines like Dawn spacecraft. Thrust is really weak, but it can produce almost constant thrust. If it works for a long time, it is still enough. This type may not be the fastest, but it is very efficient and requires less fuel. I will probably do a separate video on iron thrusters. The fourth and the most complicated type is the impulsive trajectory, but also with gravity assists. So let's talk about those. If we relied solely on chemical engines, many of the famous space missions wouldn't be possible. The first thing that comes to mind is Voyager's mission. 
Now both spacecraft are outside the heliosphere. On their way, both of them visited Jupiter and Saturn. And Voyager 2 also flew by Uranus and Neptune. And to this day, it remains the only spacecraft that visited those two planets. So if they took use only of chemical engines, they would not go farther than Jupiter. They would only go into the elliptical orbit like the one shown here with paracenter at the Earth's orbit and apocenter at the orbit of Jupiter. And they would go back and forth just like Musk's Tesla. But somehow NASA managed to make them go much farther. When the spacecraft were near Jupiter, they performed a gravity assist. Gravity assists are a big part of interplanetary flights. But how do they work? It's easy to see how an object can be accelerated mechanically like this. But in the case of a spacecraft flying by the planet, there is no mechanical interaction. Well, yes, but there is a gravitational one. When I release a ball, it falls and accelerates down, not because I hit it like this, but because of gravity. Now, we won't go into terminology and formulations and say whether it is a Newton classical terms or the ball is following the trajectory in the curved space-time, as it is formulated in general relativity. What's important for us is that we see the ball accelerating towards Earth. Now let's get back to our spacecraft. We gave it some velocity with chemical engines, and it is flying to outer planets. If its velocity is not enough to achieve a hyperbolic trajectory, it will keep going back and forth in the elliptical orbit around the Sun. Unless it collides with something, but this is unlikely. But if it gets close enough to a massive body, that can affect its trajectory. Something interesting might happen. I believe it will be more clear if we talk about components separately. There are two very similar words, speed and velocity. And yet they are different. So speed is a scalar and velocity is a vector. Scalar is described with only one number. It has only magnitude. In the case of speed, it is, for example, some kilometers per hour or some miles per hour. But vectors have both magnitude and direction. That's why they are often written with an arrow up top. When talking about spacecraft, we usually use the word velocity, magnitude and direction of velocity. So how can a planet affect those two components? First, let's say a simplified scenario. Let's imagine that our spacecraft reached Jupiter, but the planet for some reason has stopped. I mean, it's not moving in its orbit and also manages not to fall into the Sun. Of course, it's just a hypothetical scenario. We calculated the trajectory in a way so that it would get close enough for planet's gravity to affect it significantly. In NASA's online spacecraft encyclopedia, there is a useful analogy. From the planet's point of view, the spacecraft flying into its gravity well is similar to a cyclist going downhill and then going back up. And also let's say that cyclist isn't pedaling. He already gained enough speed beforehand. When the cyclist goes down, it accelerates, gets a temporary boost in velocity. If it was going fast enough before that, it would be able to climb back up. But of course, while climbing up, it slows down again. And if there was no friction and no air resistance, after climbing up, it should have the same velocity it had before it went downhill. But it did have a temporary boost. In space, we mostly don't have issues with friction, and in this analogy, gravity well of Jupiter is this downhill slope. The spacecraft goes into the well, gets a velocity boost, and if it was moving fast enough not to get captured by planet's gravity, it escapes the gravity well, slowing back down. But so far that doesn't seem very useful. What is the point if the final speed appears to remain the same? Well, let's look here again. Initially, the spacecraft had this trajectory. Then Jupiter began attracting it. And then it continued flying in this direction, so it didn't change the magnitude of velocity, but the direction did change. So a planetary flyby lets us change where the spacecraft is going, and we can make use of that. But obviously it's not the only reason to use gravity assists. We just had a hypothetical scenario when the planet wasn't moving in its orbit. But that's not possible. Planet is orbiting the Sun. It has angular momentum. When the spacecraft gets under the planet's gravitational influence, the planet not only starts to attract the spacecraft, it also transfers some of its orbital energy to it. Imagine you are running past a merry-go-round that is spinning very fast. You jump onto it in the direction of its rotation and somehow manage not to fall, and then jump off of it merry-go-round can accelerate you in this process. So here it is something similar, just without the mechanical interaction, but rather with a gravitational one. So there is a transfer of angular momentum from a planet to a spacecraft, and that's how it accelerates. And if one body gains energy, the other has to lose it. So every time we use a gravity assist, we basically steal some energy from a planet and actually slow it down in its orbit. 
but don't worry, we won't drop Jupiter onto the Sun anytime soon. For a small spacecraft, yes, the energy gain is significant, but for a massive planet, the loss is minuscule. But it's there. So gravity assists allow us to alter both magnitude and direction of velocity. So this is what it looks like. We launch a spacecraft, send it to an elliptical orbit using chemical engines. In the new orbit, it is able to reach a planet where it gets acceleration and change of trajectory, and it's now able to get to a farther planet, which would be unreachable if we relied solely on chemical engines. And gravity assist can not only accelerate a spacecraft, but also could slow it down if we fly by a planet on the opposite side closer to the Sun. Gravity assists are used not only to get to outer planets, like in the case of Juno that performed this maneuver near Earth to get to Jupiter, or New Horizons that use gravity assists near Jupiter to reach Pluto, as well as Cassini spacecraft, Voyagers, and so on. The spacecraft that target inner planets use gravity assists to, let's say, lower their orbit around the Sun and get closer closer to a target. This is a flight trajectory of Bepi Colombo that is now on its way to Mercury. It is performing several gravity assists. Another great example is Parker Solar Probe that uses seven Venus gravity assists to gradually slow down, actually as close to the Sun as none other spacecraft did before. Gravity assists can be used to change orbital inclination. And again, all that requires a lot of complicated calculations and planning, tons of factors need to be taken into account and even such things as pressure of the sunlight. The fact that we can study solar system with all current limitations is a great achievement of engineers and scientists. For us, it is hard to even comprehend how to plan all this and not to miss a body that is hundreds of millions or even billions of miles away. But it is still possible and is a great testament for what humans can achieve. Thanks for watching. Links to all of the sources are as always down below in the description. And if you enjoyed the video, leave a like, comment, and subscribe not to miss new videos. Bye.